Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cassandra List. She's a board certified physiatrist, and that's a physician who specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation. She completed her medical degree at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago and her residency at Medical College of Wisconsin. So naturally, after all that freezing, she decided to come to Florida. Mm -hmm. After her residency, <laughs> Dr. Liss completed one of the only neurorehabilitation and spasticity management fellowships in the country, which consists of an extra year of extensive specialized training focused on neurorehabilitation and the use of botulism toxin injections and Intra... Intrathecal baclofen pumps and botulinum yes. toxin. We don't give patients botulism. <laughs> botulinum. <toxin. laughs> botulinum. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, today, Dr. List serves as the medical director for the stroke rehabilitation program and the medical lead for the spasticity management program at Brooks Rehabilitation Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. List. Thank you for having me. Um, and actually, Eden just... Uh, uh, introduced me very, very well and thoroughly. So that's about the first third of my slides there. So now you know more about me, but we'll get started here. So as you mentioned, we're going to be talking about an overview of physiatry and also an overview of spasticity management. Um, and one second here. Uh, Kelly, I can't switch. There we go. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, so that's me. I think you can see me on the screen as well, but that's a picture of me. And I'm uh, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. I work here at Brooks Rehabilitation Hospital in sunny Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I'm the medical director of stroke rehab and also the spasticity management lead. Um, so happy to be here with you all to talk about these very important topics. So what we'll be talking about today um, what is a physiatrist and what is the role of physical medicine and rehabilitation? And then we'll be switching gears, as Eden mentioned, into an introduction into spasticity management. So we'll be reviewing both of those big topics. Um, so a little bit of background on physiatry. Um, so physiatry is a, a relatively small field of medicine, and it's a relatively new field of medicine um, when we talk about other fields of medicine like surgery. Uh, it informally started as a specialty after World War I when wounded veterans were coming back and society was realizing that um, they needed rehabilitation and reintegration back into the community. Um, but it really started to develop after World War II when the public became more aware of the need for rehabilitation for those who had debilitating war injuries, um, but also for those who were aff affected by and disabled by polio. So. Um, physicians realized that, and the community realized that there wasn't really one physician that was treating patients with disability as a whole or taking a holistic approach to rehabilitation care. Um, and so that's where physiatry was born. Um, so they were looking for to develop a specialty of medicine that would treat a whole patient um, in order to try to restore function after disability. So in January of 1947, the now American Board of Medical Specialties formally recognized the American Board of Physical Medicine and later turned into the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Um, and so the, the specialty of physiatry was born. So what is a physiatrist? So we have a few different names just to make it extra confusing. <laughs> So a physiatrist, it can also be pronounced physiatrist. Um, I'm biased, I, I pronounce it physiatrist, but as you can imagine, it sounds a lot like a psychiatrist. So that can sometimes get confusing in Googling or in referrals. So uh, some, some people say physiatrist to try to distinguish it from psychiatrist a little bit more, um, but physical medicine and rehabilitation or PMNR for short. And so what physiatrists do is that they work to restore and optimize function and ability to optimize the quality of life in those patients who have been affected by any physical and cognitive impairments and, and disabilities. So our goals as rehab doctors are to maximize a patient's independence and mobility and activities of daily living, cognition, communication, and swallow. And I'll get into a little more detail about what all that means. So physiatrists uh, work and, and manage uh, many patients of many, many different uh, uh, reasons that they've developed a disability. So here are some that are listed in alphabetical order, amputation, brain injury, cancer rehabilitation, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, osteoarthritis, Parkinson's disease, spasticity and movement disorders, spinal cord injury, 
spine pain, back pain, um, sports related injuries and strokes. So there are some physiatrists who work as general physiatrists, meaning they see patients with all sorts of rehabilitation needs for all sorts of diagnoses. Um, and then as the field has grown, we've also had physiatrists that are more subspecialized. So um, as we mentioned, I'm a neurorehabilitation physiatrist. So I work with mainly stroke and spasticity management or people who have had damage to the nervous system, um, as opposed to an, an amputee physiatrist who's seeing patients who have required amputee and now um, need a prosthetic leg um, or a patient who has undergone cancer and, and cancer treatment and needs to be restored to their function after the debility that, that the cancer and the treatment treatment cause. So um, as the field has grown, the more subspecialized we've become, but the, we still have physicians who practice general rehabilitation as well. And then I wanted to give a little bit more practical example because I think um, sometimes, and I don't blame anybody, it can be very confusing as to where is the line between a neurologist and a neurorehabilitation doctor. Um, and, and oftentimes people will confuse me for a neurologist um, simply because um, it, it, there is a lot of overlap, but I try to give some practical examples that a neurologist focuses on diagnosing and preventing a new or progression of a diagnosed neurological disease. Whereas a physiatrist works to optimize the function within a diagnosis. So most physiatrists already have the diagnosis and we're working to rehabilitate within that diagnosis and the neurological deficits that are related to that diagnosis in order to minimize the burden of disability and optimize quality of life. So for example, with Parkinson's disease, the neurologist would be the one to diagnose and usually manage most of the medications to try to minimize progression, as opposed to a physiatrist would assess the current function with regard to mobility, activities of daily living, cognition and communication, and work to maintain what you have um, and work with you along the progression of disease to optimize quality of life within the disability that is present. All right. And the thing about physiatrists is that we don't work alone. We're, we're probably the one of the few fields of medicine that works as a team um, with other uh, interdisciplinary team members. So what, what I mean by that is that the rehabilitation doctor oversees the rehab team, but we have experts in other fields that help and um, us to get the best outcomes for our patients. So this includes a diverse group of therapists, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. We also work with case managers psychologists and nurses all under the direction of the physician, all team members working together towards progress and optimizing qu quality of life and function for our patient. So I'll go a little bit deeper into some of the different types of therapists or um, the team members of the rehabilitation team, because I know that this can get confusing as well. We tend to say physical therapy for everybody, but there are different types of therapists. And the broad categories here are physical therapy. And generally speaking, physical therapists focus on uh, lower limb therapy, so strengthening of the legs. And they focus on mobility. And by mobility, we mean how do we get from point A to point B? So balance and transfers is one of them. Um, but then also mobility, whether you're walking or you're not walking. So if we're strong enough and balanced enough to walk, how is the best way that we can get you from point A to point B safely? Do you need an assistive device like a cane or a walker or a rollator? Or do you need a brace to help you walk and clear your foot so it doesn't drag? Um, or if we're not able to walk, which type of mobility device is going to give you the most independence or the best quality of life? So if we're working at a wheelchair level, is it better to have a manual wheelchair? Is it better to have a motorized wheelchair? Is it better to have a scooter? So those are all the questions that the physical therapist is working to, to answer and working with the patient to get them the best quality of life and function. And then we have occupational therapy, um, which generally speaking, focuses of strengthening of the upper body, so the arms, um, but they also work to, uh, on the activities of daily living. So activities of daily living are pretty much the things that we take for granted that we do in our day-to-day -day life until we have trouble doing them, and then we realize how important they are. Um, so these are our household tasks or work tasks, feeding, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, um, all those things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis are what the occupational therapist helps to work on. And then we have speech therapists that work in three general categories, um, one of them being swallow function or, or dysfunction. So if people have weakness in their swallow muscles, how do we strengthen those muscles or how do we strengthen our breathing muscles? 
And then <clears throat> are, is there a risk that we're aspirating or that food or liquid is going down the wrong pipe and potentially we could be uh, at risk of developing what we call an aspiration pneumonia or a pneumonia that develops because food has been accumulating in the lungs because it's going down the wrong path. So they help us to assess the swallow function as well as recommend diets with different consistencies if we need to in order to minimize the risk of aspiration or, or food going down the wrong pipe. Um, and then they also work with communication. So both the speaking communication, but also receiving communication and then cognition. So our thinking, our memory, our processing, um, our concentration, our problem solving, that is all the, the role of speech therapists. And then rehabilitation certainly focuses on the rehab of the patient, but we also focus and provide caregiver training. So rehabilitation for those that are helping to take care of the patient. Um, so we may work on things like training on uh, for safe transfers or assessing the need for transfer equipment. Does a patient need a slide board or a Hoyer in order to make it easier to get from the wheelchair to the bed? Um, we also do training on dressing, bathing, and hygiene, and hygiene or toileting routines that are safe for both patient and caregivers. Um, we also work to develop a bowel and bladder routine that the patient and the caregivers are comfortable with that promotes continence and, and hygiene. And then we teach caregivers how to perform range of motion exercises and, and pressure reliefs to minimize the complications such as contractures and wound development. So it's not uncommon that um, I'll send orders for therapy in order to assess how can we decrease the caregiver burden. Um, the disease has progressed or, or we're at a point where the caregiver is working really, really hard. Is there any equipment that we can use? Is there any energy um, preserving strategies that we can use so that the day-to-day -day life is just a little bit easier? And then rehab occurs in a variety of settings. So there's the two main categories are inpatient or facility-based rehab and outpatient rehab. And we'll go into the, the differences between them. But the big questions that we ask is, is it medically necessary to be inpatient or in a facility? And how much therapy can a patient tolerate or are they available for in a day? So first we'll start with the acute inpatient rehab. So this is hospital-based rehabilitation. Patients need to be able to they have the need and need to be able to tolerate three hours or more of therapy daily or uh, 15 hours of therapy a week. And they need, they have to have needs in at least two of the disciplines of the three disciplines that we talked about. So they need to have needs in PT, OT, and speech. Oftentimes patients have needs in, in all three disciplines, but at the very least they need to have needs in two of the disciplines. And then this is the most intense re rehabilitation is in the hospital setting. Um, but they have to have, patients have to have the medical need for a physiatrist to be available daily. So patients are at a point where they're still needing medical oversight on a day-to-day -day basis and 24-hour nursing care. So patients are a little bit sicker and that's what requires them to be in the hospital. Another inpatient setting is a skilled nursing facility. So in this situation, a patient, it's medically necessary to be inpatient, but they're not requiring that daily physician oversight. Um, they're at least medically stable enough that they are okay to be seen by a physician one to two times a week, or um, they have a, a slower recovery and they're not able to tolerate the three hours of therapy. And so they're getting about one to two hours of therapy a day. Um, uh, each day that they're there, but there is also limited nursing care. So you're a little bit healthier. You're not as sick as when you're in the inpatient hospital, um, but you still need oversight and you still need that intensity of therapy. It's just a little bit less intense than in the hospital-based therapy. And then once we're out of a hospital or facility setting, um, then we talk about outpatient therapy, which is comprised of home health and, and strictly outpatient therapy in a therapy gym. So with home health, um, the patient is medically stable to be outpatient, but they have mobility or medical issues that limit their ability to leave the home. And in that case, they're getting PT, OT, and speech to come visit in the home two to three times per week. And then with outpatient therapy, patients are medically stable enough, again, to be outside of a facility, they're at home, and they're able to attend outpatient therapies in a clinic or, or a therapy gym. Um, and this is usually two to three times per week, but it can be up to five days a week uh, if needed. And of course, this all depends on, on the condition that we're talking about. And I'd just like to point out here, at least in, in my experience, or at least uh, in, in the state of Florida with my experience, um, insurance will usually only pay for either home health or outpatient therapy. So for example, if a patient has 
um, home nursing and they have a wound that they're working on and they're ready to go to outpatient therapy and take advantage of the equipment that outpatient therapy has to offer, um, but they still need that home nursing care, we can't do both. They have to do home therapy until that wound is healed and their medical needs from a nursing standpoint are, are improved enough um, that they don't need the home nursing and then we can transition to outpatient. So that's a question that comes up a lot where, well, can we do home therapy for this, but then go to the therapy gym for this? No, unfortunately, insurance will only pay for, for one or the other at the time, at the time. Usually we'll transition patients from home health out to outpatient altogether. All right, so that is an overview of physiatry. What questions do you have? Was a question about how could you find a physiatrist? Like for example, if someone's in Wisconsin, how would they find a physiatrist there? Is there a list somewhere? Are we looking for the PM and R after the, the yeah. name? What are we looking for? Yes, so great question. Um, and I, I don't have a great central database, um, but definitely from, from Google, when you Google, just make sure to put probably easier to put physical medicine and rehabilitation or PM&R. Don't be surprised if even then psychiatry results come up because unfortunately it does get confused a lot, um, but physical medicine and, and rehabilitation, and I can provide it to you with, with a link after Eden if you're able to send it out, but the um, uh, American Academy of PM&R does have a database where you can search by uh, zip code and then it can show you the, the physiatrists that are available within that zip code. Um, with that being said, there are multiple diagnoses that physiatrists treat, like we talked about. So a sports medicine physiatrist is very different than a cancer rehabilitation physiatrist. So just be wary of which physiatrist you're actually selecting. Also, um, someone asked, I think this would be more of an insurance question as to whether or not they need um, a referral for you, but is it something that you would say, yes, I always need a referral, and if so, it has to be from a neurologist or a movement disorder specialist. Could it be from a PCP, or is that strictly based on your insurance? Yes, usually it's um, more insurance-based. Some insurances allow for direct um, seeing of a, of a specialist. Others require you to see the primary care, which is an unfortunate burden for our primary care uh, physicians. But, um, but yes, uh, most of the time, we can just do a, a direct visit. Um, and, uh, and yes, it would just be looking for more rehabilitation needs. Someone asked, is there some overlap among physiatrists and like pain management specialists who might even advertise as a physiatrist? Um, do you, I know we're going to kind of get to this a little bit later, but, uh, about pain management, such as spinal injections and stuff, is that, is there overlap or are you kind of separate? There is, and, and not to get too much in the weeds, but some fellowships or, or subspecialties like pain management allow different specialties of medicine to do that fellowship. So for pain management specifically, um, you can come from anesthesia or you can come from physical medicine and rehab. So then you go on and do the fellowship together and you're both um, pain management certified after the fellowship. So, so yes, there are physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors who are subspecialized in pain management. They do actually, because um, a lot of uh, the needs, uh, like we talked about in in physiatry, were originating from veterans coming home from World War One and World War Two. Um, actually, the VA has a strong presence in um, with physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, I will say there are just not that many of us in in general in the world of medicine, right? There are more surgeons and, and internists than there are rehab doctors. So, um, but I believe every VA does have a rehabilitation program because that's a strong component of their care. Um, it just um, some have bigger ones than others. So for example, I, I trained in Milwaukee and we had a very big spinal cord rehabilitation unit um, and then a, a general rehabilitation unit as well. But yes, they, the VA should have rehabilitation resources. What about um, almost like taking two separate paths as uh, the gentleman put it, uh, going the PMNR path versus the neurologist who then prescribes PT and OT? Can you tell me a little bit about some of those differences? Because you still do work with the PTs and OTs, so. Right, absolutely. And, and I would say that certainly, you know, your, your primary care or your surgeon or your neurologist are going to be prescribing physical therapy or occupational therapy for different reasons as well, or, or for reasons that you may need along the way without needing to see a rehabilitation doctor. Um, I would say that the, the difference is that usually 
as rehabilitation doctors, we're in constant communication with the therapist because we work so closely with them. Um, whereas, you know, depending on the setting, every, every practice is different. Sometimes the neurologists are a little bit more removed, but absolutely the neurologist can prescribe and, and should be prescribing physical therapy, occupational therapy, and, and speech therapy if indicated. What does the care team look like though when they go to you? That you you're treating something, but then you also refer to physical therapies, but some of the things you do also do work with physical therapy. Can you kind of give me a broader picture of what that looks like? Sure. So a patient will come see me and they're they're I'm pretty much the starting point. Now we're talking about come seeing me, coming to see me in clinic, right? No, as opposed to a hospital-based visit where you're doing inpatient rehab. So when you come to see me in clinic, and um, I'll give you an example of uh, a stroke patient, somebody who's suffered a stroke and now they can't move a side of their body um, and they are having trouble with thinking and processing. So I work to formulate a, formulate a plan as to their rehabilitation and recovery. So I would refer them to physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and cognitive therapy, and I would probably also refer them to a neuropsychologist because neuropsychologists do um, cognitive testing, standardized cognitive testing to understand that higher level thinking processing. Um, so I, you know, it may seem sometimes like I send out a lot of referrals, but then I also get a lot of data back. So you really understand the big picture of your function. Um, something else that might come up is somebody who now is having more frequent falls. Um, so we try to identify in the visit what is it? Is there a specific trigger? Is there a time of day? Is it um, a, a certain part of the house? Is it after you take a certain medication? How is your blood pressure? So we just go through different things that could, le could be in leading to an increased fall risk. Um, and then I would usually send to, to physical therapy to work on strengthening balance. And then I would work with the physical therapist and, and chat with you about well, what specifically, what are you noting when, when you're putting this patient through their therapies? Are you noticing that they're getting lightheaded? Are you noticing that their blood pressure is dropping? So those are the types of things that we, we do in our clinic. Any other questions? I see a question, but that's about Botox and she's gonna get to that. Are there any other questions before we move on, before we resume? Would you be able to analyze causes of gait dysfunction? For example, discern between gait symptoms and gait problems due to like cervical spinal stenosis. Would you be able to basically say that's not your Parkinson's? That's actually, is that something you would do or, okay, you're not in your head. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, so certainly, and, and I'll get into this a little bit with, with my next lecture as well. Um, but just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean that you're immune to every other condition that could possibly happen to the human body, right? You could still have a pinched nerve in your back. You could still um, fall and, and have a brain injury. So, um, so part of our job, and not that it's always easy, but part of our job is to try to distinguish um, what what's causing what? Is this coming from Parkinson's or is this coming from a pinched nerve? Is this new weakness or did you have a stroke? Um, and that's something where we overlap a lot with neurology. Um, so it may be something that we diagnose because we've been seeing you from a function perspective, but we also may work with neurology and be like, listen, I think something has changed. Should we order a repeat MRI or should we get a nerve conduction test? So that's where that collaboration happens as well. I think we're good to move on. But we'll come back for questions at the end. Technology is great when it works. There we go. Yes. All right. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about spasticity management. All right. Oh, sorry. Okay. So what is spasticity? So spasticity is a condition that may develop after a patient has had damage to either the brain or the spinal cord. And patients may notice it as muscle stiffness um, or muscle tightness that occurs after the diagnosis of stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, and more. And so I'll show you some more typical patterns, but this is a little bit of the typical pattern that we see where the arm can get stuck to the side of the body, the elbow can be bent and the wrist and the finger is curled or the leg can stick straight out with the foot pointing down. Um, 
And then um, I want to touch on muscle tightness specifically because um, there's spasticity and there's rigidity and a patient can feel muscle tightness and it's up to us to really distinguish is this spasticity or is it rigidity? Um, so spasticity comes from conditions like strokes, mind you, they're both originating from the nervous, the central nervous system, okay? But spasticity is, is usually by other causes. So things like stroke, spinal cord injury, traumatic or non-traumatic brain injury, and cerebral palsy. And it's really what distinguishes it is it's a velocity-dependent increase in muscle tone, meaning it's more noticeable with fast movements. So you move the muscle quickly and you feel a catch and resistance through the range of the motion of, of the movement. Um, and it's usually more resistance in one direction than another when the muscle is stretched, as opposed to rigidity. So rigidity, we see more in conditions like Parkinson's disease or, or the more rare neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And rigidity is really a, a muscle stiffness that does not change with velocity. It doesn't matter how quickly you move that muscle, it's going to be give you tightness or, or resistance throughout the whole range of motion without having anything to do with the velocity of movement. And it's the same resistance in all directions as opposed to just one direction gives you more resistance than the other. Um, so there is you know, an overlap, but as, as I alluded to earlier, um, it's important to know about spasticity and the difference between spasticity and rigidity. For, for this lecture, we'll be focusing on spasticity because as, as I was starting to say a second ago, the, just because you have Parkinson's disease doesn't make you immune to other neurological diseases or injuries. So you could have a stroke either before or after you were diagnosed with Parkinson's. And then it's up to us to really distinguish if the muscle tightness is coming from spasticity or if it's coming from the Parkinsonian rigidity, or you could fall and, and unfortunately hit your head or your spinal cord can be damaged. And then you could develop different muscle tightness than, than what you had been experiencing before that fall. Um, so that's why we'll, be, why we'll be focusing on spasticity today. So I, I already started to talk a little bit about this, but nobody's a textbook. I say this over and over again, but nobody's a textbook, but these are the common patterns of spasticity. This is generally speaking what we see where the arm is stuck to the side of the body, the elbow is bent, the wrist is down and curled and the fingers are curled, the thumb may tuck into the hand. With that being said, I have definitely seen patients where the arm sticks straight down at the side of their body and they're not able to bend it at all. So everybody's a little bit different. Um, this is just the general patterns for the upper extremity. For the lower extremity, we tend to see the thigh adducted, meaning it, it crosses over or pulls in. Um, the knee can either go in or, or stick straight out. Um, and then the ankle can point or the foot can point down and in, and then usually the toes curl, but every once in a while we have that big toe work as a hitchhiker toe where it sticks up and it makes it hard to put on your shoes or, or your braces. So this is what patients say that when they usually describe spasticity, when they're coming in with muscle tightness and they're saying, well, my toe curling, it bothers me when I walk, or I can't get my thumb out of my hand, or my legs keep crossing. Um, they're trying to do cares or, or help to clean me up and my legs will just clench up and lock up and they, they can't help to change me. Um, or they hear me coming when I walk because my foot is catching so much, or my brace is rubbing because my foot turns in as much as it does. So how do we manage spasticity? Um, so therapy and stretching are the basis of spasticity management. We want to develop an exercise program where we're constantly working to stretch and move the joint so it doesn't get stuck in one, one region. We talk, you may hear the word contracture come up a lot and, and, and it, I hear it, it, there's a distinction between muscle spasticity and contracture. So um, a contracture is when the, actually the bone fuses. So it starts with, usually starts with the muscle. The muscle is pulling a lot but then the bone follows. If, a, if the joint is stuck in one position for a long time, we can develop a contracture where the bone has now fused in that position. So therapy and stretching are really what we want to do to promote a regular day-to-day -day, um, stretching of the muscles and try to prevent contracture development. And then we also have bracing and casting, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Medications, these are muscle relaxants, um, botulinum toxins, intrathecal baclofen pumps, and then if we need to, surgical tendon lengthening and some more options. So I tell patients, you know, it's not usually one of these things that's going to be the management of your spasticity. It's it, We do one thing, it works well. Usually when we put things together is when they work the best. So it usually ends up being a combination of things that we do to help to manage the spasticity. 
So we'll touch on bracing. So <laughs> there are a few different types of braces. Uh, the one that you see on the left is a rigid brace, meaning um, you, if the fingers are curled, you stretch the fingers and you put the hand in the brace and it stays in that position. And so that's good to help keep the hand stretched, for example, in this example, so that when, um, say, you get up to do something, the hand isn't as tight. Or if you wear it overnight, there are some comfy braces that are worn overnight. So then in the morning, the hand is a little looser. Um, and then there are dynamic braces, which is the one here to, to the right of, of that. And this tends to be, a, this is a Dynasplint from the company Dynasplint. This tends to be a little bit more of a cumbersome brace, but I tell patients it's more cumbersome because it has more components to it. Um, and what you see here is a hinge. Um, so what happens is you put, in this case, the arm in the brace, and then that allows you to stretch the arm. And then once you have that stretch, then you can adjust the hinge and stretch it further and further and further. So it allows for you to change the position of the arm as you stretch that arm further, whereas opposed to the rigid brace, um, you can't do that. But there are pros and cons to both braces. Like I said, some people really don't like how big this the Dynasplint brace is. So I'd rather you have the, the rigid brace that, that you'll wear. You know, a brace that you don't wear doesn't do anybody any good. So <laughs> I'd rather have the brace that you wear um, and that keeps your muscles stretched. And then for the leg, there are multiple braces for the leg as well, just like the ones that we showed for, for the arm. Um, but um, the, here, what you see on the left is an AFO or an ankle foot or throat orthosis. That's what that stands for AFO. Um, and this is used to help with walking so that the foot, when it's pointing down, it, it prevents, or it tries to prevent, let me say that way. It tries to prevent the foot from pointing down so that you don't catch the foot as much and you don't hopefully don't trip and fall when you're walking. And then there's another, um, this is a multi-potus boot where, um, the the uh, foot is put in, this is usually worn overnight to allow for some stretching of the calf so the foot doesn't point down overnight and it gives you more flexibility when you wake up in the morning. So there are several medications that are available to help with spasticity. The most common one is baclofen. That's the one that we use the most for spasticity management, but <clears throat> they're all muscle relaxants. And, and what I say is, as you would expect, muscle relaxants can make us sleepy. And, and usually for managing your spasticity, you have a whole slew of other reasons to be sleepy. Sometimes um, other medications may make you sleepy. Um, you know, your medical condition can make you sleepy. So sometimes adding that muscle relaxant, even though we're trying to tackle the spasticity can make you sleepy. And, and that doesn't do anybody any good, right? If you're sleeping all day. So, um, so the baclofen is good. I see patients that are on high doses and they do just fine with it, but I see patients that are very, very, very low doses and they really can't tolerate it. So it's really just seeing how your body reacts to it. And I, I say that it's good at relaxing things overall, but it's not great at relaxing stubborn muscles. So say, for example, if your fingers are curled, baclofen usually doesn't touch those specific muscle groups. It's great at, at it's better at relaxing things overall, or if people are having frequent muscle spasms or the legs are jumping, that's where I see the baclofen helps a little bit more. But you know, I, I tell patients it, it's okay to try it. We just have to be cautious with the dosing so we don't make you too sleepy. And then we talk about botulinum toxins. Um, so botulinum toxins, there are currently um, four commercially available botulinum toxins. Botox, uh, Xeomin, Dyspor, and Myoblox. So um, all are from different companies, but are botulinum toxins. And what they are are muscle relaxants that we inject into the muscle to help to relax the muscle in a more focal manner. So to, to relax specific muscle groups. Um, so what happens is, so for example, if you come to see me for spasticity, I talk to you about how is the spasticity getting in the way? What are you noticing? Is it hard to get dressed because the arm is so tight and close to your body? Is it hard to pull your fingers open so that you can cut your nails and, and keep the skin of your hand clean? Is it hard to go to the bathroom because those spasms in your leg just kick in? So trying to get, really tease out what is it that's interfering with your day-to-day -day function? And then doing a physical exam to put that those pieces together as to, and come up with a muscle dosing plan as to which muscles I think are the most problematic. Um, and then we go in with about an acupuncture sized needle. Most of us use guidance to confirm where we are. I use what's called EMG guidance. And, and what that means is there's a little microphone at the end of the needle and I'm listening to the muscles as I'm injecting. So it's helping me to confirm my muscle plan and, and what I'm thinking. Um, and then I inject a little bit of the medication. It doesn't kick in right away. It takes a few days to a week to kick in, slowly starts to relax the muscles. Peak effect is four to six weeks, and then it slowly, slowly starts to wear off, okay? So what I say is the good thing is it wears off and the bad thing is it wears off. 
So if it works really, really well, it will eventually wear off. It's not a permanent fix. But if it works too well, if it over relaxes the muscles, which is something we have to be aware of, it's a muscle relaxant. And that's the biggest risk with it is that it can lead to weakness. But the weakness isn't permanent. Okay, so I'll give you the example of a patient. She came in and her fingers were really, really, really tight. And I always ask, well, what do you do with that hand? And she says, nothing. It's a paperweight. I don't do anything with this hand. <laughs> I just want these fingers to be stretched and relaxed because I'm just pulling on them all day long. And I said, okay. So, so she comes back and we talk about it. And she's like, well, doc, you did it. You relaxed my fingers. I can now stretch out my fingers perfectly. But what I found out is that I didn't realize I was working on trying to grab the refrigerator door with that hand. And now that my hand was looser, I wasn't able to grip that refrigerator door but the, the effects of the Botox were off. And so what we did was come down on the dose and then we found a, a happy medium where she was able to still grip that refrigerator door, but the fingers weren't so tight that she was fighting them all day long. So yes, it, you may hear that it can cause weakness and it's a muscle relaxant and we need to be aware of that, but it just means that maybe we just need to adjust the dose and it's not a permanent effect. It's, you're not gonna have long-term weakness from Botox. Um, it is medically indicated and FDA approved. Um, so that we're talking about medical um, indicated Botox as opposed to or botulinum toxin as opposed to cosmetic botulinum toxin. So cosmetic botulinum toxin is out of pocket usually, um, but this is medical indication. So it's usually covered by insurance. Usually we just need a prior authorization to, before we do it. And then last, we'll talk about intrathecal baclofen pumps. So like we mentioned, baclofen is a muscle relaxer. These pumps were developed because of that known side effect of baclofen where it does help to relax the muscles, but sometimes we have to go to such high doses that people don't tolerate and, and they end up sleeping all day. So they developed this pump, which is about a hockey puck size metal pump. Um, you can see the x-ray here where a patient has it implanted and it sits right in your belly fat. Usually that's where it gets implanted and just under your skin. And there's this catheter that runs under the skin all the way to the back, right to the spinal cord region where your spasticity is originating from. And so what it is, is that the baclofen comes in microgram doses as opposed to milligram doses. So it's a tiny, tiny dose that you put through the catheter and in, in the pump and through the catheter that gets delivered right where the spasticity is originating. So it's really targeted delivery of the muscle relaxant baclofen. So this gives us more flexibility and effectiveness of the dosing for spasticity without some of the sedating side effects that the oral baclofen can sometimes, ca sometimes cause. So the baclofen is being delivered 24 hours a day. So it helps us to manage our spasticity different than say, for example, taking a pill. Um, and the goal is to improve spasticity management and wean off of the oral muscle relaxant. So that it would be, you know, fewer muscle relaxants that you take, but also more effective spasticity management. Now in the world of surgeries, this is, I say, this is a small surgery, but it's a surgery nonetheless, and it carries its own risks. So we have serious talks with patients about what are some of the risks? What are some of the benefits? What are potential complications that could happen? And, and what do they need to know? Because it is a commitment. Um, because the pump will need to be refilled, you know, the medication gets used up and we have to refill that pump before it gets used up so that patients don't have any side effects from, from losing the medication. Um, so every few months, patients will have to come into the clinic, we, put a, we clean off the skin, we put a little needle through the skin to access the pump, take out whatever little bit of medication is left, and we put in fresh medication and you're good to go. Um, and of course, we do any sort of dose adjustments, which are done with a little programmer through the skin, so no needle going through the skin for, to program the pump. Um, and then there is a try before you buy. So we do an intrathecal baclofen pump trial where they put uh, a bit of medication of the baclofen into your back and then you stay and are monitored um, and work with a the therapist to see how you react to the baclofen. It just gives us a general idea of, of making sure that nothing bad happens, no unexpected, unexpected consequence of the baclofen um, and see uh, what sort of results we get from the trial before we go to surgery. Um, and I do tell patients it can be used in combination with botulinum toxin. So Again, maybe the baclofen pump helps to really control the spasticity, but those, again, stubborn finger muscles just won't give to the baclofen pump. But then we can use more of the botulinum toxin to focus on those select stubborn muscles as opposed to having to spread it out everywhere and try to attack a bunch of muscles. So how does this help? Why does it help to manage spasticity? Mobility, active, active and passive range of motion helping to facilitate transfers. Um, I have patients that they say, every time I try to transfer, my leg just sticks straight out and it makes it very hard or my leg will start to balance, I'll get clonus and it makes it very hard to transfer. Activities of daily living, like we talked about getting dressed, cleaning and hygiene, 
making it easier to open the hand and cleaner cut the nails, easier to relax the legs, um, improve the foot catching and improve toe curling. So there we have it. I do have questions. <laughs> yes. So the first one someone asked just, and I, I, I wondered myself, is dystonia considered a form of spasticity? Yes, yeah, so it's it is uh, it's a little bit different mechanism. Um, so dystonia can develop without any uh, trauma to the brain or the spinal cord, and like without stroke. So people who are have not had any neurological injury can develop dystonia, um, and it is still an involuntary muscle uh, activation. So sometimes we'll see dystonia where the neck will be positioned in one side. That's what we call a cervical dystonia. Um, but similarly, somebody who has had a stroke can notice that their neck muscles are tighter and now they sit in, in this position. So same si sort of an action, um, a little bit different uh, uh, brain pattern. You know, I would say with dystonia, we're still figuring out exactly why some people are more vulnerable to developing dystonia than others. Um, but I'll say we, we usually manage it very similarly to spasticity. We had talked about, um, so people do have question Oh, before I go on, I'm going to ask someone, is dyskinesia a form of spasticity? I don't think so. Dyskinesia is well, a it's, reaction. Yes, it's, so they're all within a family and a spectrum. Let's put it that way. So they're, um, they're different terminology for similar movements. Someone asked about the Botox, because obviously that's going to be the hot one. Mm -hmm. It does relax the muscles, so it is used for rigidity, but would it just be used to treat pain? No, certainly tight muscles can cause pain. Um, that's the, we know that it can be very uncomfortable when your muscle is constantly contracting. Um, so the, the main goal is to relax the muscles and try to limit that pain. Um, uh, there are some studies that have shown that potentially Botox has um, pain inhibiting uh, features or, or factors. Um, and there's a thought that maybe for the migraine Botox, it's, it's maybe not so much the muscle relaxation, but actually the attacking of the pain fibers. So still not too clear in the evidence, but we do suspect that it does help with pain as well. Someone, uh, because you had talked about how sometimes the dose of Botox can almost be too much and over relax. What happens if nothing, you, you get the dosage of Botox and you have no benefit. Is that just mm -hmm. maybe this doesn't work for me? Is this maybe I just needed a higher dose? What happens in that situation? Yes, so great question. So usually, and, and most of us that, that do botulinum toxin or Botox injections, um, you know, we start at a dose that we think will do something, but not so much to, to do too much. With that being said, if a patient comes back, says, doc, you poked me a bunch of times and nothing happened. So that's okay. At least nothing bad happened. So it wasn't harder to do things. So you didn't get weaker. So I have room to go up on the dose, or I may need to adjust the muscle pattern. So usually we'll do three rounds of injections. Um, not that we have to do three rounds of injections, but we'll usually do three rounds. And if we've adjusted the dose three times and we still haven't seen benefit, then I say, you know what, I'm not going to keep poking you because now we've increased the dose. We've, we've, we've adjusted the muscles and we're still not seeing benefit. So, you know, I'm, I'm probably not, not something that's going to work, but most of the time it's that the dose is too low and, um, and we go up on the dose or we change the muscle selection. Um, with that being said, I do have some patients uh, who have Parkinson's and it can be, like I said, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish between the rigidity and, and the spasticity. And so we have a candid conversation of saying, look, I, I don't think it'll hurt. It, the, what it might hurt is if it causes too much relaxation and, and that will wear off. So I think it's worth trying. And worst case scenario, we don't see any benefit from it. And we adjust the dose and we may not see any benefit. And then we know that this is more the muscle tightness that's coming from the rigidity rather than spasticity. Because you had talked about um, some of the side, well, just the tiredness of the baclofen oral. Mm -hmm. Are there other side effects? And is that specific to a, to a specific dose? Like the lower the dose, the less likely to have side effects? Or could you tell a little bit about the symptoms of the oral baclofen? Uh, usually that's the biggest one that we look out for. Sometimes people can feel dizzy or they can report uh, cognitive changes like they're not thinking right or they're in a fog. Um, those are some of the things that are most commonly reported with baclofen, uh, but we all, always try to start low and go slow. It's one of those medications that we're, we're not going to start at the highest dose right away. And like I said, some patients are on 
baclofen and tizanidine, which is another muscle relaxant, and um, a methocarbamol, which is another muscle relaxant. And I'm like, how are you still standing? But they are, you know. So it really just depends on the patient's particular body and, and their tolerance. So, um, but yes, it's something that we start low and go slow. And but it's really the fatigue, any sort of cognitive impairments or or changes in their thinking, um, and and lethargy. to take baclofen is needed with Parkinson's meds for leg spasms. Yes, and that's something that I would talk with your specific doctor about, um, about your specific condition. But generally speaking, um, it's it's not contraindicated in, in Parkinson's. Someone asked, are swallowing issues and dysphagia, would those fall into either of the categories of spasticity or rigidity? Um, so sometimes what can happen is that patients will have a uh, spastic vocal cords. So they'll notice that their voice changes because they're, um, sorry, I'm doing this motion because the vocal cords are two little flaps that open and close. Um, but, um, but they will do Botox. Um, I don't, the ear, nose and throat doctors usually will do, they'll, they'll look down and see how those vocal cords are functioning. And if that's interfering with your swallow um, at all. Um, so they'll sometimes do Botox for the vocal cords. That's more for your voice quality. Um, but, but there are all sorts of different indications that botulinum toxins have been approved for now that, that they weren't before. So um, I think a lot of specialties in medicine are using them for different indications. Someone asked if internal muscles like intestines have spasticity. They, you know, we think that they do. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the arms and legs and like we talked about the neck that gets spastic, but there's really no reason why your abdominal muscles can't be spastic. And that's where I will have patients that report that their abdominal muscles are just cramping. They're, they're, they just feel this con constant cramping. Now it is a little bit more challenging to inject those muscles. Um, there are different risks that go along with injecting the abdominal muscles. So, and I will say it's not, um, I should probably say it, it's not on label or FDA approved to inject those muscles. Um, this is an a Botox specific lecture, but you should probably know that it's not something that's uh, clinically approved by the FDA, although there are indications that, that physicians do do them for in specific cases. You talked about um, spasticity versus rigidity. And so someone mm -hmm. kind of said, could we talk a little bit more about rigidity? But like, what, what happens? So somebody comes in, you do um, an assessment, and you kind of say like, this is more rigidity, this is not really, this is not spasticity. Well, what does that, what does that look like? Could you kind of tell us like what, if somebody sure. were to come see you, what, what is it that? Yes, yeah, so I'm looking for especially that that physical exam component of to, to try to distinguish as much as I can rigidity versus spasticity. And in some patients, like I said, it, it's really hard. It's it's you look at a textbook and you're like, oh, this is easy. But in some patients, it's just really hard to tell the difference. Um, and especially if patients are more contracted, they've been in one position for a long time, and then it's just hard to move the joint altogether because they just have no movement. The the muscle is just stuck, and the, the arm or the leg is just stuck. In in one position. Um, so that's where I will have that, that candid conversation with the patient or the, or the caregiver, um, because there are times where, um, you know, we don't really know if somebody may have suffered a stroke because maybe, you know, I, I'm thinking of one specific uh, patient and, and his wife who um, he, he wasn't talking, he wasn't communicating with her very much. And um, she was really doing the bulk of the work to get him in and out of bed and in and out of the wheelchair. So um, if, if he would have, it would have been somebody that would have been hard to identify if a stroke had occurred without getting an MRI, for example, to really look at the brain structure. So, um, so yes. So in those cases is where I have that candid conversation of, of look, I'm I'm willing to try it because of X, Y, Z, you know, specific reasons why we should or should not do the botulinum toxin, and understanding that you know these are the risks in doing this procedure, and if you're okay with taking those risks, I'm okay with taking those risks too, and and let's see what we get from it. This is the second time you kind of mentioned the care partner. Have, have you ever recommended that the care partner go for some sort of physical therapy? For example, like you talked about helping somebody get safely out of, you know, out of a chair and stuff. Is that something mm -hmm. you do recommend? And okay. Yes, absolutely. And there have been times where you know, the, the disease has progressed and um, maybe a patient was able to get in and out of the wheelchair on their own and, and now they're not able to. 
or um, they suffered a fall and broke their hip and things that they were able to do before are, are now not able to. Um, so as things change for whatever reason, um, then we talk about, well, what can we do at, at this point? And it may be that we bring them inpatient for caregiver training so that we can get a whole view of what's going on. Okay, so what happens when you go to the bathroom? How are you transferring um, your loved one or, or, or the patient? How are you um, helping them to toilet. Okay, well, why don't we work on this strategy or you can use this piece of equipment to make it a little, little bit easier. So sometimes we'll, we, we will bring patients in for a short inpatient rehab stay where we can do specific caregiver training. Um, other times it'll be just individual therapy that I'll send for physical therapy and occupational therapy so that we can talk about and work with the therapist to try to figure out strategies to make life a little bit easier for the caregiver and also make it safe for the caregiver because, you know, I don't know about you, but nobody ever taught me to transfer a patient, right? So a lot of people learn, you know, it's trial by fire. So they learn as as their care as their patient is is needing more help, they just start to do it, and unfortunately, that can lead to injuries for the caregiver. And an unhealthy caregiver is no good to a patient. So we got to keep everybody healthy, as healthy as we can in the situation. So certainly, I will refer for caregiver training or or assessment of the home environment to see what sort of equipment we could use to to help and make it safer for everybody. caregiver training for example if they have that situation where they're homebound yes sometimes we do where we'll do we'll start with kind of a home assessment so we'll do it in the home so they can really see the therapist can see real life situations of this is my bathroom this is where my bed is positioned this is where we put the wheelchair so in those cases we usually start with home health um, to really simulate, I mean, not simulate, but actually do the scenarios that the caregiver may be struggling with um, so that we can come up with ideas of how to make life a little easier. Would a massager, like a Theragun that's a concentrated massager, would that ever help with the dystonia or that's just going to kind of make it make, make it feel better for a little while, but it's not really going to help with it? Um, um, so great question. It it uh, usually doesn't hurt, although I will say some patients go for a massage and they're like, oh man, that was a tough massage. But um, but yes, what, it, what we find is that it just unfortunately doesn't have long lasting benefits. Um, so they may go for the massage and it'll last a couple of days and then the muscles get tight again. Um, with that being said, I, I also get the question about acupuncture a lot, if um, acupuncture would be beneficial for spasticity management. Um, they, we don't have strong literature to support it. Um, with, with that being said, I do have some patients that will do acupuncture and um, they'll do it as the Botox is wearing off. They'll do the acupuncture to kind of help to get them or they'll do the massage to help to get them in, until the next injection because we have to wait. I, and I meant to mention this and I didn't. We have to wait at least three months between injections. The reason for that is that if we inject too often, it can work like a vaccine and then we can become immune to it and might not be as effective in the future. So we know that three months is a safe window where the toxin is out of our body and it sees it as a new injection. Um, so smaller risk of becoming immune. So sometimes people use um, these other options like uh, massage or Theragun or um, acupuncture to, to bridge them through that time until they get the next Botox injection. Um, uh, also, I will say that sometimes my patients will use that same thing where with the medications where they will hold off on the baclofen when the Botox is in effect, but then as the Botox start to wear off, then they'll use the baclofen. And I, I think I didn't answer somebody's question about using it as needed. Yes, sometimes we use it as needed. Um, we find that we build more of a tolerance when we have it scheduled. So we may not be as sleepy as when we're taking it on a regular basis, um, but I, as, as long as your body tolerates and your brain tolerates, we will have patients that take it as needed as well. Talk a little bit about treatments for the rigidity, if that's what people are suffering from. Like, yeah, is it and, and unfortunately, that's um, more of a assistance with uh, Parkinson's disease management and any medications that we can do to try to limit the progression of Parkinson's or slow the progression. Um, so uh, unfortunately, at, at this point, we don't have great options for rigidity management specifically, other than general Parkinson's disease management. in the chat um it did come up if if somebody asked if you do telehealth visits and we had discussed that prior that you do um specific to florida only so you do telehealth but only in the state of florida you said there was a website that people could go to and put in there what is that website again um so it's aapmr
let me see, I can probably put it in the chat box if I can figure out where that is. <laughs> I got it. I say I just needed to put it in and then I can put it in the chat box and then people can put in about um, there we go. and then people can put in for their zip code and get this information. So I'm putting that in the chat. There we go. And Dr. List also put it in. As always, I encourage everyone to save their chat for this information. If you click on the three dots at the bottom of your chat, it will, a little more will pop up and you can save your chat that way. Um, someone did ask about, does CBD oil help at all? With Again, that to me would probably be more pain and topical. That's not really going to treat anything. Yeah, I, I, we don't have any evidence to support it. Unfortunately, we just uh, probably don't have enough data yet to, to comment on it. So nothing that I can say that, that the science shows. This has been incredible. I thank you so much for your time today. Oh, no, it's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. As always, we have a wonderful tradition here at PMD Alliance, our wave of gratitude. And thank you so much for your time today. You have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Lewis, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.